Good morning. Uh, thank you very much for uh, you know joining today. So this is gonna be a very uh, oops sorry. You know very exciting uh, workshop to bring in uh, people from uh, AI and also people from uh, mental health practice and also research. So we are you know literally in the same room. Uh, you know open a discussion on how AI can be utilized for the you know uh, mental health. So for your information, you know, we're going to uh, try this at Saido.com. So if you have any questions to the, you know, invited the speakers or uh, later during the, you know, panel discussion, if you have any questions, then uh, go to Slido.com slash AIRW 2019. And then, you know, type in your, uh, you know, question, then, you know, we can actually see from our laptop, okay? So somehow we'll, you know, project. And then uh, we try to answer to your question. Okay, so I wanna uh, open this workshop with uh, by introducing uh, this recent, uh, you know, the report. So this one came out CC, uh, CCC and Triple AI recently, actually the last month, and it shows you know twenty-year uh, community roadmap for the AI research in the U.S. And they mention about you know six societal you know areas that will be transformed by AI, right? As you can see, you know healthcare, education, and business innovation, national security, uh, social opportunity, and scientific uh, you know discovery. So you know list seems now really um, surprising to me, but one thing I found a very interesting thing is that they are talking about the prevention of illness and also uh, elderly care, and mental health, and also behavioral you know, health, right? So, you know, in a way, the discussion that we are doing today is very well aligned with uh, you know, this community. They are looking at uh, you know, 20 years down the road from now, okay? So I wanna give you a little bit of a uh, background over our team. So today, uh, we're gonna have uh, three invited speakers, and, uh, and also uh, many you know, other speakers, most of them are came from UC San Diego. So UC San Diego is one of our uh, IBM AI Horizon Network uh, University. So we are doing research together on AI for healthy aging. So we are looking at uh, physical and cognitive and, you know, mental health changes of older adults. Older adults, by definition, you know, 65 plus years old. And you know we are collecting multimodal uh, data set and try to utilize AI uh, to figure out the early signs of, of functional decline. So we've been working almost like uh, two years, you know, right for now. So we we try to tackle lots of challenges, and some of them I, I actually listed here. So uh, we want to see uh, what is the objective way we can actually assess the behavior and thoughts of these older people. And also, what is the early signs of uh, you know, functional decline? And what are the risk factors? And what are the protective you know, factors? And also, what's the innovative strategy for prevention and intervention? And, and also, of course, you know, data is a big, big challenge, right? So, you know, data availability and ethics and access and so on. So these are the challenges we try to uh, tackle. I want to introduce another report that recently came out. So this one, uh, two months or so ago from uh, World uh, Economic Forum. So this report is about the ethical adoption of you know, technology. So already mobile, internet, and AI technology is widely used for the mental health, especially uh, self-care of you know, mental health. So this technology basically provide anytime, you know, anywhere, and any way kind of a uh, you know, way, right, to provide a service. And also, it is scalable and also very uh, you know low cost, yeah. but still early stage. But certainly, uh, you know, rapidly, technologies are rapidly adapting uh, to this domain. And these are the couple of uh, startups out there. So I mean, you might know you know some of uh, these companies already. So MindStrong and Seven Cups and you know Inuka and then Spring Health. So there are lots of you know technology based mental health, self-care, uh, you know, business is going on and people have a lot of, you know, ideas, new ideas, right, try to adapt, you know, this domain. So I think uh, that's why this is a very 
timely, uh, <laughs> right? You know, to have uh, this kind of open discussion, we're opening the discussion about the AI, AI for mental health. Uh, but as you can imagine, you know, this is not a small challenge. This is, we are talking about really, really, you know, big challenge, right? So we need to consider many, many things, and these are some of uh, you know things that I can think of. So. You know, in terms of setting, I mean, do we want to uh, apply AI for clinical setting or, as I mentioned earlier, you know, self-care uh, setting? So what's the best practice, right? And then what's the barrier uh, preventing effective care? Uh, who are the target, right? Are we targeting on the, you know, young, young people or, you know, older adults? And is there any way we can unify the metrics, you know, for assessment? And, of course, the data, you know, this is a big, big challenge, especially for the uh, you know, ment uh, there are seats over here, so you guys. Yeah. Especially, you know, mental health related, uh, you know, data set, you know, there are lots of stigma issue and, and privacy issue, so that's a big, big, uh, you know, challenge. And again, right, what can be a, a right technology and tools in terms of intervention and, you know, prevention? And also, uh, interesting topic is like, uh, you know, how we can train uh, mental health, you know, workers, right? So. I don't think we can touch all this topic today. Uh, we'll very likely focus on, uh, you know, clinical setting and maybe the you know older adults and so on. But hopefully, uh, you know, we can think about these uh, all these topics and, you know, we can certainly have a further discussions. Okay. So this is uh, uh, today's agenda. So we have a very uh, nice setting of uh, you know invited speakers and so on. Uh, but the talk is about 20 minutes. So. Uh, so I think you know, 15 minute talk. Then maybe we can uh, take uh, one or two questions for each uh, each speakers, and then we'll have a you know open discussion Q and A session. Uh, you know, 10, 30, uh, 10 to 10:30, 10, 30, 30 minutes, and then at the end of the you know session, and later uh, today we'll have a panel discussion on the data ethics. So we'll have all you know speakers coming out and then discuss with you guys. Uh, what is the challenges for the dealing with especially data uh, related to mental health? So, because we have uh, like a 20 minutes, so we're not going to introduce all you know uh, speakers, their background, in all the details. But these are list of our speakers. So, so quickly, uh, Dr. Uh, Brazil from MIT, uh, Dr. Deb from uh, UC San Diego, uh, Dr. Ferrante from NIMH, and Dr. Zest from UC San Diego, and myself from IBM and Dr. Lee from UC San Diego, and Dr. Nebeka from uh, UC San Diego, and uh, Dr. Park from MIT, and uh, Dr. Toros from uh, you know, Harvard. So, so they are the invited speakers uh, taking a uh, lead discussion today. Okay, thank you very much. And with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Uh, Dilip Jest from UC San Diego. Hi, good morning. And thank you, Hotel. Uh, Hochal and I want to welcome you all uh, to this session. Uh, it's really an exciting session, and especially want to thank uh, Michelle Ferente, Cynthia Brazil, uh, John Torres, who will be here, and Hewan Park uh, for coming here from outside UCSD and IBM. So I'm going to talk about AI for mental illnesses and mental health with a focus on aging. So this is our San Diego team. Uh, and you'll see a number of the people here from our group uh, in this picture. The Center for Healthy Aging at UC San Diego is really unique in several ways. It brings together School of Medicine, School of Pharmacy, School of Engineering, and School of Management. These are the four schools UCSD has along with the general campus. So this includes social sciences, biological sciences, arts and humanities, uh, technology industry, as well as senior housing. Welcome to John Torres. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's really nice that we bring together the whole group, which is essential for studying aging. Aging doesn't belong to any one specialty. So there will be two parts uh, to my talk. Initially, I'm going to talk about mental illnesses and the opportunities for AI. Second half, I will talk about mental health and opportunities for AI. I'll talk about how these are not exactly the same, mental illnesses and mental health. 
And I will give you an example of the approach to dementia in the first part and loneliness and wisdom in the second one. So in terms of mental illnesses, the DSM-5 is called the Bible of Psychiatry. Uh, that's actually, it's a big fat book that includes the, all the psychiatric disorders there are. There are 22 different categories of illnesses, which includes more than a couple hundred uh, illnesses. So this is published by the American Psychiatric Association. It was published in 2013. Uh, and I actually was the president of the APA at that time. So I was actively involved in designing this. And one thing we realized, actually, that one of the shortcomings of DSM-5 is that the criteria are mostly subjective. They are based on what the clinician diagnoses. We don't have in psychiatry at this time, for most illnesses, any biomarkers or any technology-based assessment. And that's the great opportunity for AI to make an impact. So the diseases. They said there are 22 different categories, uh, including uh, psychosis, depression, anxiety, PTSD, sleep disorders, and sexual function disorders, and so on, what I view. The one I'm going to focus on a little later is uh, dementia, because that's uh, what is applicable to older people. So there is both need and opportunity for AI research in this field. Uh, why? 20% of the people in the US, as well as all over the world, have a mental illness. So one in five. So that actually accounts for a large population. And there are high healthcare costs associated with conditions like dementia and depression. And yet, there's a severe shortage of psychiatric clinicians, severe shortage of psychiatrists, psychologists, nurses, social workers who specialize in mental health. So the future of medicine needs technology. The current system of individual clinicians taking care of individual patients is not sustainable because the gap between the supply and demand is huge and it is growing. At the same time, there are issues in applying AI to mental health field. Unlike most of the other medicine, in psychiatry, the clinical practitioners are hands-on and patient-centered, relying on soft skills. Skills like forming relationship with patient, observing patient behaviors and emotions. So these are hard to measure using technology. And the data are subjective. So the data include qualitative statements by patient who say that I have these symptoms, um, but not others, and written notes by physicians, nurses, and other clinicians. So it is mostly subjective, unlike other branches of medicine, such as surgery or imaging, where the skills that are taught are hard skills. When it comes to aging, it becomes even more complicated. Uh, we all know that the population is aging. The average lifespan in the US in 1900 was 45 years, okay, 45 years. Today it is 80, in 2050 it will be 90. So from 1900 to 2050, the average lifespan would have doubled from 45 to 90. This has never happened in the history of the world, in the history of humanity. So there's something radically changing and that is increase in the number of older people uh, and also, aging is heterogeneous. You know, we think that as people get older, they become more similar. Not true at all. As people get older, they become more different from one another. So you can be highly functional, older person, or you can be somewhat disabled, or you can be totally disabled in a wheelchair. Also, within the same body, different organs age at different rates. So my liver may be 50 years old, kidney may be 20, and um, spleen may be 100 years old. Uh, Multimorbidity. There are multiple body systems that could be affected. Something called stochastic events. 
unexpected events like stroke, heart attack, fall, which suddenly change the equation rapidly. And high rates of dropouts in studies for the various reasons. And importantly, there is a dearth of data on technology in older adults, especially the old, old people, people over age 55. That's the fastest growing segment of the population. The number of people over 85 are going to quadruple in just a couple of decades. And yet, there are practically no data. Most of the technology companies don't study people over 85. They're harder to study. And there are other issues, such as they're not being used to the technology, so they are somewhat resistant to use of that. So for all these reasons, it is both a challenge and opportun opportunity for AI. So the potential for transforming neuropsychiatric research and practice. <clears throat> so some of the data are quantitative, such as EMR data or imaging genetics. So there one can use machine learning. But most of the data are qualitative. As I said, subjective statements, clinical notes, and there NLP would be appropriate. So there is, as uh, Hotel said, there is a lot of potential for AI to develop behavior-based digital phenotypes. That's really something badly needed. We are hoping that the DSM-6, the sixth version, when it comes out, would be much more um, based on these such digital phenotypes. Uh, identify biomarker-based subtypes. Redefine neuropsychiatric diagnosis, facilitate early detection of disease. Uh, enable better monitoring, personalized treatment, predict treatment response, and offer scalable intervention. The AI can do that. The current healthcare system cannot. So it really has a potential for transforming what we do in this field today. <clears throat> so I'm going to focus on dementia. Um, there are 50 million people in the world today with uh, dementia. In the US, there are 15 million. The rest of the world, there are another 35 million. That number will rise to 130 million by 2050. Think about the 130 million. That is more than the populations of number of countries combined. Uh, and yet, there are no ways to prevent or cure dementia. So at this stage, our main focus has to be on early, very early detection. And here it is difficult. Dementia comes in different sizes and shapes. There are different types of dementia. There's Alzheimer's dementia frontotemporal dementia, some, another something called Lewy body dementia. Um, I think you all know Robin Williams. Uh, Robin Williams actually had Lewy body dementia. And there are a number of famous people who have had Alzheimer's disease. So what do we do? IBM UCSD Center at uh, UC San Diego. Our focus, so we, in, so given the challenges that I described, what we think is needed is a team that includes experts and trainees from various areas working together. So we have experts in uh, mental health, experts in geriatric health care, experts in technology, ethics, health assessments. And we follow a community partnership approach. Um, these are the studies that we do in a one particular continuing care senior housing community. I think some of you are familiar with these communities. So they are called continuing care community in the sense they have independent living. So you typically enter when you're functioning okay. Then as you become disabled, you move into assisted living sector. Then as you get more cognitively impaired, move into memory care and nursing home. The assessments are comprehensive. So they include physical health, cognitive function, psychosocial functioning, wearable sensors, uh, audio tapes of qualitative interviews, video tapes of structured activities. And Colin Depper talk about this. This get up and go is one of the tests uh, that is used. And these are the sensors, um, uh, sleep, um, EMR, uh, electronic medical records as well as biomarkers, including microbiome and blood-based biomarkers. So it is really critical to have all of those data. And that's where, again, um, AI is critical. So the long-term goal is to identify the earliest signs of decline so we can do something. By the time 
the patients develop symptoms, it is too late to do anything, but the pathology has advanced a lot. So that's about mental illnesses. So going to mental health now. So 20% people have mental illnesses, as I said. But 100% people have mental health, all right? I mean, all of us have physical health, cognitive health, and mental health. So what is mental health? So mental health includes the states like happiness, well-being. On the other hand, it could be sadness and anxiety. There are traits such as resilience, optimism, social engagement that affect not just mental health, but also physical health and cognitive functioning. And why is this different from the illnesses? There are no criteria. There are, there are no books like DSM-5 that describe uh, their definitions and how you assess them. Why should we bother about these traits? There is a lot of literature showing the importance of this. For example, there is a meta-analysis of 83 studies of optimism, and the conclusion was that optimism is associated with better cardiovascular outcomes, better physiological markers like immune function, better cancer outcomes, and lower mortality. All of these findings significant at P less than 0 0.00001, whatever, calculate. So very highly significant. Social engagement, even stronger database. Meta-analysis of 148 studies from across the world with more than 300,000 people. These are studies including men, women, people of all ages from different countries, different races, ethnicities, diseases. Look at this, 50% increased likelihood of survival during the study period among socially engaged people compared to non-socially engaged people. The effect sizes for optimism, social engagement, and resilience for increasing longevity are equal to or greater than those with stopping smoking, doing exercise, taking statins. I just want to show you one study of optimism. This was a Dutch study of about 500 men over the age of 65 who did not have cancer or heart disease to start with. So at baseline, they divided people into three groups those who were most optimistic, those who were most pessimistic, and people in between, based on the rating scale. And then they followed these people over a 15-year period and looked at how many people died from heart disease, okay? They found that the optimist lived eight years longer than the pessimist. So there's significant difference between optimist and pessimist in terms of longevity. And this is after controlling for past history, family history, exercise, smoking, use of statins. So optimism seems to contribute something over, above and over all these factors. <clears throat> we did a study a few years ago of um, people, all the adults, in the sense from age 21 to 100, the entire adult lifespan, about 1,500 people who were randomly selected Okay, so this is a randomly selected community-based sample over the entire lifespan. And then we looked at both physical health and mental health. The physical health, as you would expect, declines with age. So in the 20s and 30s, people are at the top of their physical health, um, fountain of health, right? And then it starts declining. But this fountain of health doesn't apply to mental well-being because mental well-being goes exactly in the opposite direction. 20s and 30s, people have the worst level of stress, anxiety, and depression. But the good news for people in 20s and 30s is that things will get better <laughs> progressively. And as you get older, this mental be and this is now, this finding has been replicated by multiple studies, including one that was just published last month in Journal of American Abnormal Psychology. 600,000 Americans they studied from age 18 to 70s, and they found exactly the same thing that the anxiety, stress were highest in the 1820 and then progressively declined. So there is something that happens with aging that's actually positive. We usually think about aging as all bad. Not true. There are things that actually get better with aging. So now switching gears slightly in terms of the threads, I want to start with something negative that is loneliness. <clears throat> 
Loneliness is a major public health uh, importance area. It's also a business area. The IBM Institute for Business Value published a report uh, two years ago on the impact of loneliness on businesses. Uh, come back to that next slide. Loneliness and social isolation, they're related. Loneliness is subjective. I feel lonely, for example. Whereas social isolation is objective. It how many friends I have. So that is social isolation, okay? So loneliness and social isolation are called silent killers. They have been shown to be as dangerous to health as smoking and obesity. In the US, this is by the way from the US uh, Agency of Healthcare Research and Quality, 162,000 people per year die from social isolation. That's greater than the number of people who die from lung cancer or stroke. In the UK, a new Ministry of Loneliness was established last year. The main reason was business. They found that the country was losing billions of dollars because of loneliness of the workers. That loneliness was associated with a bunch of diseases that reduced their productivity, and that's why they decided to have this uh, Ministry of Loneliness. So we did a study, Ellen Lee was the first author of this paper. This was a collaboration between IBM and UCSD uh, that received actually wide publicity, uh, including CNN and BBC and what have you. Um, so we found that loneliness was quite common even in San Diego, which is supposed to be, you know, paradise. <laughs> uh, and there are, it was common across the age groups, but it was most common in three age, age period, late 20s, mid 50s and late 80s. Why should we care about loneliness? Because it has health consequences. Loneliness is associated with increased risk of cardiovascular disease, metabolic diseases like uh, depression, uh, like um, diabetes, obesity, uh, depression. So why is loneliness associated with uh, these illnesses? Several reasons, one of which is biological. Very nice genetic study of uh, loneliness that was done in UK, including about half a million people. They found that the genes associate. They found that loneliness is modestly heritable, about 50 percent, and that's true for most traits like resilience, optimism. There are about 50 percent inherited, which means 50 percent they are affected by the environment and behavior. So we can modify them. The genes responsible, genes associated with loneliness often were the ones that were also associated with cardiovascular disease, metabolic disease, depression, triglycerides, and HDL. So there's a biological reason why loneliness may be associated with illnesses, and there's, of course, psychological reason. If you're lonely, you feel depressed, you're not likely to go out, so you're not likely to have physical activity, you will be sedentary, not eat a healthy diet, and all of those things combined. The good news, the best news, actually, from this study of loneliness is that Loneliness is inversely correlated with wisdom. I'll talk about what wisdom is in the next couple of slides. But this was a highly significant finding. Um, the correlation was minus 0.51 in this MTurk study. This is a study of 3,400 people. Uh, and we have replicated that finding in two other studies, including one from Italy. Um, so this is, I think, a real finding um, with a high, high effect size. So what is wisdom? So wisdom is another personality trait, like resilience, optimism, loneliness. But it has several components in it. They include self-reflection, ability to look inwards and try to understand ourselves, emotional regulation, control over the emotions, but with some happiness, contentedness, positivity. Pro-social behaviors like empathy, compassion, altruism, things that we do for other people rather than for ourselves. Decisiveness amid uncertainty. So, so we, a wise person accepts the fact that there are different perspectives. And he or she is not sure exactly what his or her perspective is the right one. There may be other ones. So you accept uncertainty. At the same time, you can't be uncertain all the time. You don't get anything done. So, you have, so it's a balance between decisiveness and uncertainty. And lastly, uh, spirituality. So based on that, we actually have developed a scale for measuring wisdom. And wisdom, like other traits, is biologically based. We have published paper on the neurobiological basis of wisdom, the neurocircuitry of wisdom, if you will, which includes prefrontal cortex, 
dorsal lateral, ventromedial, and anterior singular, and when, uh, limbic striatum, especially amygdala. So this is my next to last slide. Uh, so there is really, so these are important things, resilience, optimism, loneliness, wisdom. It's a great opportunity for AI because these are subjective, harder to measure right now, objectively. So we are doing some of these early studies. Uh, for example, uh, Ellen Lee is doing a literature review following the systematic um, method of literature review. And Kaoru and Yasu from Japan are looking at this from the NLP perspective. So we'll see how the two methods compare with each other. Uh, Self-rated scale. So these are scales for all of these. And so that's where machine learning can help. Qualitative interviews, which are audio tapes, so that's where NLP can help. And then to find out predictors and interventions. The long-term goal is with sensors, biomarkers, and AI, we hope to develop behavior and biomarker-based digital phenotypes for loneliness and wisdom. This is really critical. And these are just loneliness, wisdom, or examples. Same thing would apply to um, resilience, optimism, social engagement. These things have significant impact on health, and we should be able to measure them objectively. That's a challenge. It will happen. But again, that's something like, I appreciate any suggestions uh, you may have. And this is my last slide. So the pills for health and longevity are not statins and other drugs that we talk about, but healthy lifestyle social engagement, and wisdom. Actually, if people had all these things, the incidence and prevalence of heart disease, strokes, and some cancer will plummet, and the healthcare costs will be saved. So thank you for your attention.